watching. Welcome to the big story. I'm Regina Lay. I'm Gretchen Ho. And I'm Risa Diaz. Tonight's big stories. Disgraced Mayor Alice Guo says she's not the mastermind behind Fogo's criminal activities, but just a victim herself. She goes behind closed doors with senators for a tell-all session. House lawmakers call Vice President Sara Duterte's behavior a betrayal of public trust after she snubs for the second time the House plenary debates on her proposed budget for next year. And the Philippine Navy monitors a record number of Chinese warships at various features in the West Philippine Sea, especially at Escada Show, which the BRP Teresa Magbanwa left just over a week ago. Alice Guo has denied being the mastermind of illegal pogos in the country. In fact, she says she's a victim too. Guo told senators she will reveal who the most guilty party was in an executive session. And so off they went behind closed doors this afternoon. But before that, Senator Riso Monteveros presented several photos of a former PNP chief together with the pogo personalities. And that former chief is Benjamin Acorda. Camille Samonte with a big story tonight. Your Honor, hindi pa ako mastermind. Mga sasabi ko po, isa pa akong victim. This was how Alice Go characterized herself during the latest hearing on Pogos in the Senate. But when asked if she was just a front for syndicates, Go denied it. The former Bamban mayor added that by now, senators know who exactly is behind the illegal Pogos in the country. Uh, Your Honor, hindi naman po siya ginamit. Ano po akong tao, helpful akong tao. Kung meron man po, uh, yun lang po. Pero sa mga activities po na ginawa or sa mga, alliga sa mga allegations po, uh, wala po akong kinalaman. I think sa tagal po na investigation, alam na rin po ng committee po, especially chaired by our uh, Madam Chairman, uh, who's really at the back of everything po. Go reportedly says she is ready to name the so-called most guilty behind illegal pogos. Later on, she was granted her request for an executive session to reveal everything she knows. But it almost didn't push through because Go's camp requested to postpone it until Thursday. Don't tell us where to hold the executive session. That's what we are offering. Start now. The executive session did push through, but the details of ghost disclosures were not made public. Before that, Suwal Pangasinan Mayor Dong Kalugay was also questioned about his alleged withdrawal of 500 million pesos. After last week's Senate hearing, a claim the mayor denied. He said he is willing to sign a bank waiver to prove his innocence. Hindi po totoo, Your Honor, po yung mga hundreds million na million po na 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 withdraw po your honor but do you have uh, hundreds of millions na pag-aari o salapi your honor wala po tayong ganyan your honor Senator Joel Villanueva pointed out that Kalugay's salary was not significant when he was still a policeman which led to the question of where the money came from. Kalugay responded that his family has a business which grew after he retired from the police force. In addition to Tony Yang, the brother of former presidential economic advisor Michael Yang, a photo also showed Kalugay with Alice Go's brother Wesley and former PNP chief Benjamin Acorda. Kalugay explained that they visited the Corda at Camp Krame because he used to be the chief of Suwal Police. Nagpicture lang po, tapos uh, umalis na po kami. Hindi ko po kilala ah, po yung... Nagpapicture lang kayo kay chief? Opo, Your Honor. Ano ba ang pakay niyo? Bakit kayo pumunta? Namasyal lang po kami, Your Honor. At uh, ang sabi ng mga kasamahan ko po, gusto po nilang makita po si, si PNP. Accorda will be invited to the next Senate hearing. In a statement, the former PNP chief said he loves the country and the PNP organization, adding that he only did what was necessary as a Filipino and as a police officer. For News 5, Camille Samonte, We Are One News. A disbarment complaint has been filed against former presidential spokesperson Harry Roque. The case was filed by lawyer Melvin Matibag, former acting cabinet secretary of the Duterte administration, at no less than the Supreme Court. 
This is over Rocket's social media posts, including a deepfake video of President Bobo Marcos supposedly using drugs, the so-called Polvoron video, which went viral. In a statement, Matibag said lawyers should not knowingly or maliciously post, share, or disseminate false information under the revised Code of Professional Responsibility and Accountability. In response, Rocket called the disbarment complaint against him a desperate act of attention. He said the video supposedly involving the president is a national security matter and posting it is protected by free speech. He added, the authenticity and the content of the video deserve widespread discussion. Let's try to get more details on this. We have with us tonight on The Big Story, Attorney Melvin Matibag. Good evening, Attorney. Well, thank you so much for your time. Good evening to all your viewers. Okay, Attorney, uh, just to be clear, is the Polvoron uh, video, the so-called Polvoron video, uh, the main basis for this disbarment complaint? And uh, I was trying to look for the origins of that post. Uh, see, uh, former presidential spokesperson, po ba yung original poster of that? Uh, uh, can, can you clarify that? And if that is not the only post, what other, uh, what other posts are your basis for this complaint? Well, first of all, uh, hindi lang naman yung uh, posting ng doon sa deep pick na yan yung pinag-uusapan pa natin. And uh, besides, it doesn't matter whether he is the original na nag-post or kung siya yung gumawa, but it looks like siya yung una nag-claim niyan eh. Ang uh, sinasa yung sinasabi na tungkol doon sa uh, covered by free space national security, hindi naman kasi yan na uh, floating na idea. It's uh, something that is publicated. It's been proven already. So, dun sa under the Code of Professional Responsibility and Accountability, very uh, very strong yung warning dyan ng Supreme Court, reminding all the officers of the court, all the lawyers, to act as, as, as such na dapat uh, validated dyan. Kasi if you will look at it, abogado ka eh, magaling ka na lawyer, then you will come out with a pronouncement na hindi naman validated, or worse is kung ginawa mo pa to, pineke mo. So, yung makakapanood nito ng mga ordinaryong tao, may tendency na maniwala dito eh. So this is something that I'm doing in order to protect the integrity of the legal profession. We are we are given the privilege to practice law. So ibig sabihin, dapat yung standard namin mataas eh. And this is the opportunity of the Supreme Court to come out with the rules. Paano ba natin interpret tong Section 38 na bagong rules ng CPRA na recently lang in-implement? So ito talaga yung main reason dito. Okay, uh, and I think uh, this is also the opportunity of Secretary uh, of uh, Attorney Harry Roque to explain kung ano yung take nito sa situation nito. Okay, yeah. Would you have to prove malicious intent uh, in in probably the sharing of that post? Because paano kung di, na, naloko lang din po si uh, presidential spokesperson and di niya alam na deep fake yon. Uh, kung bakak may implication lang na uh, do sa post na shinare niya. And uh, bukod po doon, na, nabanggit nga, parang may several social media posts. Ano pa po yung mga kasama doon? Uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot discuss the details of okay. the disbarment because uh, the very nature of disbarment case is confidential. You know? So mm -hmm. kaya lang nabanggit yan doon sa deep fake na yan kasi that is something really public. No? So yun na nga, doon sa binabanggit mo, ito na yung opportunity nga ni Secretary Roque na ipaliwanag kung bakit may ganun. And I think it's an opportunity also for the Supreme Court to come out with the clear jurisprudence para alam namin mga abogado kung ano yung dapat sundan namin, how to behave when dealing with social media and posting issues and the uh, mga ideas na may isip namin. But isn't this barment a little bit severe um, mm. for for uh, uh, posting something online? Uh, al alam mo kasi yung abogado, binigyan ka ng poder. Eh. Mataas ang uh, standard na binibigay sa iyo eh. Because you're given enough power. So, dapat uh, mindful ka. Ano yung magiging mga effects nito, yung ramifications sa mga gagawin mong action. So, ang Supreme Court naman, if they feel na hindi dapat in this bar, suspension lang, or kung ano mong penalty, they will be the one to decide on this matter. Uh, a lot of people share that post, the attorney. Are you going to go after them? Why single out Harry Roque? Well, as sabi ko nga dito, ang pinanggagalingan nito yung Section 38. Eh. That's a new rule under the CPRA. So, iba yung standards sa ordinary citizen at saka sa abogado. Mm -hmm. Attorney, um, Attorney Roque is calling this call for disbarment um, as a desperate act of attention. Your, your well, comment can, on that. 
He can view it uh, the way he wants to view it. And I think yung attention niya nakakuha nga. So I think he just have to wait and see the actual uh, complaint for this barmint. And that's the time probably that he can comment and do whatever he wants to do mm. to sa, sa uh, this barmint there. Because he will be given 10 days from the time he received, received the copy to answer the disbarment. Okay, because I know that the Supreme Court takes every uh, disbarment proceedings seriously. And ako, as, also as a lawyer, hindi naman ako pwedeng basta na lang mag-file ng previous na disbarment. Eh, because I also have a responsibility under my attorney's oath in the CPRA. Attorney, since we have you, let's talk politics a little bit, if that's okay. You know, the last time we spoke to you, you were still the sec gen of PDP Laban. I know, oh, you've, yeah. I yes. know you've since mm -hmm. resigned, but I never found out the real story behind it. Why did you step down? Well, uh, I, I have several reasons. No? Mm -hmm. One of that is, yung sumulat ako ng, I'm writing an article uh, every Friday sa uh, Daily Tribune, and I wrote that article is strongly objecting to the confidential fund para sa Office of the Vice President and sa DepEd. But hindi lang naman sa ahensya na yon, but all the other civil agencies. And I think hindi yata naging maganda yung pagtanggap doon. And I think there will be a conflict kung I will remain as PDP defending that position, which I don't believe legally and personally. So that's one of the reasons. And uh, other than that, my wife joined the political party of Lakas and uh, I feel that... Uh, hindi naman maganda na I be belonging to another political party na medyo hindi aligned do sa principle and beliefs ng partido na sinalian ng aking uh, may bahay. So so you're both with Lakas now? Is that correct? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, I don't belong to any party right now. Wala po tayong political party sa ngayon. Okay. I'm uh, now a private practitioner mo. Okay, got it, attorney. Um, what was your issue with the use of the confidential funds specifically? Well, for, for me, hindi, hindi dapat may confidential fund ng mga civil agencies. Uh, the confidential fund belongs only to the agencies that are uh, uh, tasked with intelligence gathering. Ngayon, kung kailangan ng OBP at ng DepEd ng, na magkaroon ng uh, confidential data or yung mga security data, then they can coordinate with the other agencies in charge with doing or the mandate to gather intelligence uh, reports. Uh, pati po ba yung Office of the President, dapat wala ding confidential funds kasi baga, hindi naman sila yung main agency uh, na... No, but, uh, the very simple. No? The President is the commander-in-chief, so he's in charge of the military, the military force, so kailangan yan. And in all other jurisdictions, ang Office of the President meron naman eh. Hmm. So that's the basis daw eh. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess uh, it's all a little bit curious, Attorney, because you are... or can I say, were a former Duterte ally. Uh, you served in former President Rodrigo Duterte's cabinet. Um, and now it seems you're on the other side. Is that fair to say? Attorney Matibag. Did I lose him or he just doesn't want to answer? I don't know. Sending, we I, think we so quiet. I think we lost him. <laughs> I'm trying to find out. Uh... Oh, okay. Is. Okay. So we have him. He's not trying to evade the answer. <coughs> Attorney Matiba, can you hear me? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. We lost yeah. you for a yeah. little bit there. No, no. You know, th there's no other side for me because I, I think I served the Duterte administration well. I followed this uh, direction. Sabi naman niya, you should always be on the side of what is uh, lawful, what is good, what is just, and what is uh, uh, truthful. Mm. So, nandun lang naman tayo. Okay. Hindi know, naman tayo nagte-take sa But we do know your wife, uh, Representative uh, Maria Rene Matibag, is with yes. Lakas CMD. And you also, I, I, I saw in a presser that you decided to um, leave PDP Laban because of her uh, interest as well. Well, uh, that, that is something personal. Mm. Pero yun ang mga decision ng asawa ko as to uh, her legislative agenda or agenda niya sa distrito niya, sa kanya yun. Mm. But uh, yun naman sa akin, as a lawyer, here, I think I also have an obligation as an officer of the court. Saka ko ano yung positioning ko. That, that is my own positioning also. Okay, having said all of that about confidential funds, can you weigh in on what's happening at the lower house right now wherein the vice president has flat out refused to appear and defend the OVP budget? She's only appeared once and we all know what happened there and that was during at the committee level. But even at the plenary, we're still, or the House lawmakers are still waiting for her to turn up. 
uh, and they haven't gotten answers to a lot of their questions. Can you weigh in on that, please? <clears throat> well, I, 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 I well, think I mean, uh, uh, that is a problematic situation with BP mm -hmm. Sara. Th that is their mandate. She should defend the budget of her office. Mm -hmm. And she should remember, being a lawyer also, there's a doctrine in political law that the powers of Congress, the House of Representatives in the Senate, is plenary in nature. When you say plenary, they can ask anything and everything under the sun. And the duty of the representatives, of the lawmakers, are to ask questions. At ang duty naman nung, nung nag attend as a resource person is to provide answer. So hindi ko naman maintindihan bakit sasabihin mo irrelevant yun when you are discussing the budget and looking at the behavior, how you spend people's money. Because at the end of the day, it's all about accountability and fiscal responsibility. So tingin ko dapat naman sagutin niya. That well, is her responsibility to answer questions. Hindi naman pwede na dahil ayaw mo lang, you will give your reasons na ayaw kong sumagot. Do you think it's uh, enough basis, uh, her refusal to answer these questions, enough basis uh, for uh, impeachment? Uh, ako naman, on that, on that note, palagay ko naman, uh, hindi naman ganun, ganun pa yan, tumaabot pa sa impeachable na offense because malinaw naman yung sinasabi sa Constitution pa na impeachable, eh, culpable violation. Pero kung tuloy-tuloy na ganyan, at paulit-ulit, series of events, siguro, you can analyze it. Pero right now, yung mandate niya, kailangan niya sigurong uh, tindigan at uh, isagot sa, sa mga nagtatanong kung ano yung dapat na sagutin sa mga tanong ng Kongreso. As a former Duterte official attorney, of course, you know her too. Uh, I'm talking about Vice President Sarah Duterte. Has she always, uh, has she always been like this? Would you say it's, um, it's uh, everything that's happening is uh, reflective of who she is? Well, actually, hindi naman kasi parte ng PDP laban si... Uh, BP Sahara, and she hmm. was never part of the PDP Laban. And she's uh, neither part of the Duterte administration at that time. But of course, she's the presidential daughter. Hmm. Pero somehow, alam naman natin, may mga influence naman siyang ginagawa dyan. So, uh, I, I think uh, during that Duterte administration, she's one of the influential and powerful individual. Hmm. Uh, you have to remember, nung tinanggal si former Speaker Alvarez, siya talaga yung author niyan. So, Maita naman natin so how she moves. Siguro, baka ngayon, akala niya the same pa rin na kayang gawin yung mga gusto niyang gawin sa administration na to. We have to realize that there's always a different mandate. Ang sa akin po dito, yung kanina nga, in relation to tinatanggol ninyo, kung pabilang panig ako, I'm always for the mandate of the people. So if the people voted for somebody, kailangan po irrespeto po natin yun. Protection na natin at all costs. She was the instigator of the ouster of former House Speaker Pantelion Alvarez. Therefore, uh, what's the implication there? You're saying that she's more... Um, uh, well, she, she, yun yung participation niya po sa mm. Duterte administration, yung mga ganun na bagay. Pero uh, as to the governance, hindi ko naman po siya nakita na involved sa governance. Mm. Ano? Mm. Pero ang sinasabi ko rito, siguro, ang pinanggagalingan nitong sinasabi ko eh, if, if she wants to get something uh, during the Duterte administration, she's getting it. She's getting it done. So ngayon, yung hindi niya nakukuha yung mga gusto niyang makuha, uh, it's uh, creating a problem, a scenario. Mm -hmm. So yun po yung pinanggagalingan siguro ng isang medyo hindi pagkakasundo doon mm -hmm. sa mga pag-appear niya po sa Kongreso. Well, sinasabi mm -hmm. niya na political persecution daw ito. Uh, actually, today, uh, there has been talk of impeachment. No? Si uh, mm -hmm. uh, former Senator Sonny Trillanes mentioned on StoryCon uh, the that there are talks public, with the House. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the betrayal, betrayal of public, public trust, trust is uh, uh, grounds right. for impeachment. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, it remains to be seen. Wala pa naman po eh. So, si lahat naman po talaga. I mean, you say politika to. Everything is politics. That is our problem with our country eh. We don't have political stability. Katatapos pa lang ng election, iniisip na kung sino susunod na presidente. <laughs> so dapat po siguro hindi ganun. Mm -hmm. uh, Attorney, what about the uh, surprise visit by Vice President Sarah to former Vice President Lenny? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sabi ng <clears throat> Robredo Camp, it was very intentional on Vice President Sarah's part. What do you think? Well, it's good that she visited the uh, former president, uh, vice president, Lady Robredo. Kasi alam po, nung turnover dapat, nung uh, June uh, 30, 2022, hindi nga siya sumipot, hindi sila nagkita. Mm. So probably she can get some advice kay 
Vice President Lenny how to behave as a Vice President. Kasi, mas maliit ka budget ni Vice President Lenny nun, 400 million lang. Eh. So, al al alamin po natin, if there are political uh, realignment or whatever, it remains to be seen. Pero isang oras sila nag-meeting, I don't think it's just personal visit. So, malaman po natin, sila lang po makakasabit niyan. Wait, your wife uh, uh, running again for uh, Congresswoman of San Pedro, Laguna? Uh, I think, yeah, she's running for the election po. Wait, 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 I was gonna say uh, that's two years too late. That she, you're saying getting that she advice. was, get, yeah, you're saying she's getting advice to how to act as a vice president. But two years, a little too too late. Two years too late. Um, uh, she's been in position uh, two years. Sometimes the realization, naman po natin talaga is too late. Eh. So tignan po natin. Pero <laughs> I'm just second kasi. guessing it. Oh, my empathy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much for your time and for uh, joining us today. Uh, we have Attorney yep. Melvin Matibag. All right, thank you. All right, going back to today's Senate hearing, senators were also able to interrogate another personality being tagged to offshore gaming, this time with Tony Yang, the brother of Michael Yang, former President Duterte's economic advisor and himself a wanted man. Full story from our mobile journal, Francis Orsho. Alam mo, ko tayo nitong Chinese national to. Marunong ka, mag, marunong ka ba nag-alog at magbisaya eh? Kunwari lang, hindi ka marunong eh. There was a new ano character who turned ka? up at the Senate's 14th hearing into Pogos. Here, Businessman Tony Yang. Tony is the elder brother of Michael Yang, uh, who in turn was the former economic advisor to President Rodrigo Duterte. Michael is another personality being linked to Pogos. Tony Yang has been living in the Philippines since 1998 or 1999 and claims that he only speaks Chinese. That's why he brought an interpreter to the hearing. Di ako makapaniwala. Quarter of a century na kayo dito sa Pilipinas, sa Cagayan de Oro included, at di pa kayo marunong mag-Bisaya uh, fluently o Pilipino fluently. Di li ako buang para maniwala dyan. Tagalog, Bisaya, maing kunti, kunti. According to Yang, he was born in Fujian, China and does not carry a Philippine passport. But he does have a Filipino birth certificate, which his grandfather registered back in 2004. The older Yang supposedly did this to facilitate business in the Philippines. Aside from a fake birth certificate, it was also revealed in the Senate inquiry that Tony Yang goes by different names. In his alien registration form, he is Yang Jian Sin. And Antonio Estado Lim and Antonio Lim in his driver's license and tax identification card. You have profited from changing your name and your nationality dito sa iba't ibang uh, submissions nyo. At your convenience, talagang for convenience, gaya ng sinabi nyo tungkol sa lolo nyo. You're only Filipino when it benefits you. According to the Presidential Anti-Organized Crime Commission, Tony is a silent but sharp operator. He allegedly runs the family's businesses legitimate or otherwise. Siya po yung parang uh, nagpapatakbo ng mga businesses, ng mga youngs. Pati pogo businesses. Yes ma'am, pati po yung pogo business niya. Even uh, yung malalaking business nila na mm -hmm. nasa Cagayan de Oro. Aling na, mga malalaki po ito? Yung uh, Sanjan, mm -hmm. uh, Steel. Uh, nasa kanya po and then uh, de, yung uh, hotel and uh, yung rice rice mill and it's a vast and secretive empire that the youngs established in CDO they uh, tried to establish yung uh, parang kingdom nila yung mm -hmm. lugar na yun ma'am mm -hmm. parang uh, hindi ka pwedeng magpasok ng business doon sa area na yun ma'am kung hindi ka dadaan sa kanya and Tony Yang also supposedly mingled with people in high places, including officials from the PNP, as high as former police chief Benjamin Acorda. Referring to photos of him with Acorda, Yang said they were taken during an event by the Cagayan Business Federation. It's not actually a meeting. It was just us visiting uh, the head of police in Cagayan during that time. Akola, Akoda. Okay. I call him Akola or Akoda. He's the former chief PNP. Yang was also asked about his relationship with former President Duterte. He said he has only seen the chief executive once during a meeting with a Chinese businessman. 
There are at least seven corporations with SEC documents registered under Tony Yang's name. That's aside from nine other businesses traced to his tax identification number. Of particular interest to senators is Yang's Sanja Steel Corporation in CDO, believed to be a pogo hub and said to have more than 100 Chinese employees. Hindi pa po namin napapasok ma'am yung lugar. But uh, yung uh, intel uh, report po na nakarating sa akin and of course yung mga documents na nakita namin, it all points to uh, a pogo operation. He does play a major role sa criminal uh, networks na, ng pogo doon. Yes ma'am. Then there's Pogo service provider Oro One, where Yang is president. His initial explanation, he only helped Oro One secure a business permit. Later on, Tony admitted that he is an incorporator of the company. Today was supposed to be the 14th and final hearing of the panel, but senators were left with more questions after today, which means they will have to hold more hearings in the coming weeks. Mobile journalist Francis Orsho, we are One News. Up next, a record number of Chinese warships have been spotted in the West Philippine Sea. What does this mean? We'll discuss this further with Benjamin Blandin, Associate Researcher for Gordian Knot and Project Sea Light, when the big story returns. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching the big story here in One News. Vice President Sarah Duterte's continued absence at the House of Representatives is stalling her very own budget. The lower chamber had to reschedule plenary debates on the OVP budget again today. She gets one last chance to defend it tomorrow. Marion Enriquez has a story. From 10 in the morning on Monday. Until the wee hours of the morning today, Tuesday, congressmen waited for Vice President Sara Duterte, or at the very least, an authorized representative from her office. Lawmakers have been patiently waiting to ask the OVP about its budgets and programs for 2025 during the plenary deliberations at the House. But no authorized official came. Kabataan Partilis Representative Raul Manuel says he is no longer surprised by Duterte's attitude, given her defiant behavior towards lawmakers. This is a clear betrayal of public trust, as every elected official is accountable to the electorate. It all started when the vice president refused to justify her proposed budget of more than 2 billion pesos next year before the House Appropriations Committee. I like to forgo the opportunity to defend the budget in a question and answer format. Then in the second round of deliberations by the same panel, Duterte was a no-show altogether. In a statement sent to House Speaker Martin Romualdez, she said that the OVP defers entirely to the discretion and judgment of the Appropriations Committee. Besides, the VP said her office has already presented its plans and projects and has submitted the necessary documents to the lower chamber. And finally, during a separate inquiry by the Good Governance and Accountability Committee, Sarah refused to even take the oath and left after a few minutes. Betrayal of public trust is one of the grounds for impeachment. But one writer, Partilis Representative Roj Gutierrez, says that's not even a consideration now. To, to be purely technical, technically po, it is in a way betrayal of public trust. But whether it would amount to impeachment, uh, masyadong malahin naman po yun. In a press conference, a Cobico Partilist representative, Jill Bongalon, floated another idea. Maybe we can ask her to step down as the vice president. Kasi nakikita natin eh, hindi naman po siya dumadalo sa mga uh, pandinig dito po sa kongreso. So ano po ibig sabihin nito? Hindi na po siya interesado at mas pinili niya pa po bumunta sa isang beach resort kaysa dumalo po dito sa pagdinig sa kanya pong budget. The OVP has issued a statement saying the VP has been on the road talking to the people about the current events in our country in Vincennes, Daet Camarines Norte, and Legaspi, all in Bicol. Wherever she is now, the House is giving Duterte another opportunity to show up and defend the OVP's budget. As head of department, you have to go through the process. And this is just bigger. This is not even about her. This is about the office of the vice president, the second highest position of the land. 
And this could be the OVP's last chance. If Duterte or her representative are still absent tomorrow, the lower house will take it upon itself to determine how much the OVP is getting for next year. Lawmakers have a deadline of September 25, Wednesday, to pass the 2025 General Appropriations Act bill before they go on a month-long recess. For News 5, Marian Enriquez, we are One News. Now, although they downplayed talk of impeachment, that phrase, betrayal of public trust, is crucial. Betrayal of public trust is a catch-all provision in the 1987 Constitution that is a specific ground for impeachment for the President, Vice President, members of the Supreme Court, members of the Constitutional Commission, and the Ombudsman. Remember that a couple of weeks ago, House Majority Leader Manix Dalipe had already warned that Vice President Sara Duterte may be liable for graft if she is unable to explain satisfactorily how she spent her confidential funds in 2022. Now, former Senator Sonny Trillanes, speaking to our sister program StoryCon today, also said he's in serious talks with lawmakers to endorse an impeachment complaint against the Vice President. Meron ba yung seryosong kausap sa Kongreso para mag-sponsor ng, uh, ng impeachment complaint? Pero po, just a matter of ano, uh, kaya, nga, kaya nga siya pumupunta, kaya nga siya naghahanap ng kakampi. That's what I'm saying. Everybody mm -hmm. should be uh, more circumspect at this point, no? Kasi, the optics are not good. Naghahanap siya ng kakampi, politically isolated na siya. So the last thing we want is masanitize yung image niya. Yun po yan. That's where I'm coming from. As for the warrant of arrest from the International Criminal Court, that was supposed to come out for or come out this month for the elder Duterte Trillanes said that's been delayed. Base po sa aking impormasyon, ano pa ho, mga late November, early December pa ho yan. Over in the West Philippine Sea, the number of Chinese vessels being monitored has jumped to 251, the highest by far this year. That's from the Philippine Navy data covering the period from September 17 to 23. The week before, they counted only 157 Chinese vessels in the area. More alarming is that the biggest number of Chinese warships has been monitored in Escoda or Sabina Shoal, which the BRP Teresa Magbanwa left just a little over a week ago. At Escoda, the Navy tallied 55 Chinese maritime militia vessels, 16 Coast Guard vessels, and 11 People's Liberation Army Navy warships. Navy spokesperson Rear Admiral Roy Vincent Trinidad said this is the first time they've monitored 11 warships there. As for the other features in the West Philippine Sea, in Ayungin Shoal, they counted 62 Chinese maritime militia vessels, or CMMs, 9 Coast Guard vessels, or CCGs, and one research survey vessel, or CRS. Iroquois Reef had 38 Chinese maritime militia vessels present, and near Pagasa Island, one CCG, 23 CMMs, and one CRS were spotted. Meanwhile, 17 Chinese maritime militia vessels were reported near Julian Felipe, or Whitsun Reef. At Bajo de Masinloc, also known as Carbo Shoal, there were two Chinese Coast Guard vessels, two PLA Navy warships, seven CMMs, and one research vessel. And finally, three PLA Navy warships were seen near Likas Island, while two CMMs were monitored near Panata Island, also known as Lankiam K. The Navy attributes the sudden spike in the number of Chinese vessels to better weather conditions. They added that each time there is a weather disturbance, the number of Chinese ships decreases only to climb again once the weather improves. What do we make of China's growing presence at various features in the West Philippine Sea? Well, let's dive into this with geopolitical analyst Benjamin, Benjamin, sorry, Benjamin Blandin. He's also associate researcher for Gordian Knot and Project Sea Life. He's also a PhD candidate in geopolitics, focusing on the phenomena of asymmetric warfare in the South China Sea at the Paris Catholic University. He is live in the studio with us again today. Okay, so that was a a whole lot of numbers she just mm -hmm. threw out. Sure. Mm. Um, we're not going to go back into them, but I will highlight the fact that there's the biggest number, they are seeing the biggest number of warships Absolutely. at Escoda or Sabina Shoal. Uh, we're talking about 11 Chinese warships, 16 Coast Guard vessels, and 55 maritime militia vessels from China. What did you make of that? 
Uh, I make that it's the biggest number by far, always in the West Philippine Sea. But you shouldn't think it's only the Philippines, because just a week ago it was exactly the same in the EZ of Malaysia. So, and for the first time, China deployed military vessels and maritime militia vessels also in the EZ of Malaysia. So it's it's quite a trend, and it just matched with what we have obs um, observed since uh, the second semester of 2023, with a, a growing presence and assertiveness, uh, constantly increasing of China. You don't reckon it's a sign that they are trying to take de facto control of Sabina Shoal, for instance? What I think is that when you look at a map, uh, Sabina Shoal is actually just right to a second Thomas Shoal. So you mm. can see the connection between the two. Mm. And it's, it's just in the trend of the past year where China has been uh, more and more present to uh, attack the interests of the Philippines. The PLA Navy ships are present in two locations, in Scarborough Shoal and Escoda mm -hmm. Shoal. And in Ayungin, for one, there's no PLA Navy ship. Does that reflect, uh, I guess, the escalation or mm -hmm. the tension in, in the area or the geopolitics of China, for example? Yeah, um, I think personally that it's not always connected. Uh, sometimes they are very present at, at a given place. Sometimes they are very present at another place, not just, as I said, Philippines, but also Malaysia or Vietnam. And um, sometimes we fail to understand the logic behind it. But what we see is that they are the only common aspect is that they are more and more present. That is uh, th what Don't we Don't overthink it. Yes. Th that's mm. what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Okay, so it isn't, uh, as some people had suggested, that they're homing in on certain features in the South China Sea. It's just the fact that they have deployed a record number of ships everywhere yes. in the South China Sea. Is well, what you're saying. Uh, I wouldn't want to afraid anyone, but uh, based on research, the core maritime militia is 200 vessels, mm -hmm. but the professional sort of maritime militia is 1,000 vessels, but they can get there up to 8,000. So at the moment, they are still way below what they could do if they wanted. Mm -hmm. Right, but don't you think this, um, you know, this sudden increase of number is, you know, is alarming? Yes, but uh, I think there's sometimes a, a share of frustration. They, they try to, so to uh, submit the Philippines, it's not working, so they try different techniques, different places, different um, uh, diversity of ships. It's, it's constantly moving, it's really a, a lead. Uh, they probably are trying to see also the reaction of the Philippines in yes. relation to those movements? Uh, I would say the Philippines have been quite measured over the past decade. They try to, the country is trying to defend itself, but I couldn't, contrary to what China says, I wouldn't call the Philippines uh, um, uh, provocative, yes. You, you believe that to be true in the squad of show because when, because, uh, when the BRP Teresa Magbano was there, um, Ray, was, Ray Powell was saying here on the show that there wasn't any particular interest in the Escuadra Shoal. It wasn't even mentioned in the arbitral award. Mm -hmm. But the basis of the BRP Teresa Magbanwa being there was um, all this talk about the possibility that China was doing an artificial island building mm -hmm. in that area. Sure. But did you think that, that kind of escalated it? Or well, that wasn't provocative at from, all for you? From my research, China is not interested in the fish in the easy of the Philippines. It's not even interested in the oil and gas. Just very recently, they, they did uh, discoveries uh, of the coast of, of Guangzhou and of the coast of uh, um, sorry, Tsingtao, uh, so in, uh, in uh, the east uh, of China. So they, they don't need the oil and gas of the Philippines. So you, you keep asking yourself, if they are not interested in these resources and these resources, why are they here? Here. Why are they doing what they do? And I think it, it has to do with something completely different, as some people think, uh, which has more to do about uh, losing face on the side of China. They, mm. they, they have pretended for so long that they own this place that they, they, cannot, uh, they cannot go back, mm -hmm. they cannot stand still. They, they need to, to, to keep pushing more, uh, sorry, bringing more pressure on this area. Interesting word you use there, pretended. Sorry, you're saying they did exploration in Tsingtao and the other one is? Yes, uh, so there is a Bohai Sea and off the coast of Guangzhou. Guangzhou, and, and they discovered oil and gas yes, there? Yes, uh, uh, very, very huge quantities mm. of them. Oh, wow, yes. okay. Um, but but with as, as far as Escoda Shoal is concerned, at the moment, of course, um, the BRP Teresa Magbano has left. Uh, and just well, now, to be replaced. <laughs> in fact, just now, um, sources are telling us that the replacement has arrived there, mm -hmm. and it's the BRP Gabriela Silang. Yes. And what's interesting about the Gabriela Silang is that it's uh, it's actually French built. Yeah, totally built by so, OCA so. Shipbuilding, which is at uh, ADS Twenty Two Four in Manila uh, from Wednesday to Thursday. Which so, you're organizing, Friday. which we'll talk about yes. it shortly. But but okay, so so what's so special about it being uh, built by the French? Can it uh, stay out there longer? Um, well. Uh, 
I think most <coughs> of the ships in the Philippine Navy or Coast Guard, they can perfectly operate for weeks or months at a time. Mm. I, I wouldn't say that is the core. It's, it's pretty much the, the quality of the sensors that are inside. It, it's really the flagship. They are pretty proud of it, very happy with uh, what they've been delivered, uh, from what I heard. Mm. And uh, they even have a, a mock-up of it uh, at the show, so I guess it's, uh, it's for a good reason. We've talked to a lot of people about this, about whether or not uh, the Magbanwa should have left Escota Shoal just mm -hmm. like that, right? I mean, we understand yes. that it's stayed out there nearly five months, longer than expected, but still, uh, some people believe that there's uh, just leaving it without a replacement yes. right away made it, left the area vulnerable. What do you think? Um, some people complain about what you said and they wish the boat would uh, remain longer but actually for a Filipino uh, vessel it's a very very long time I heard it mm. was five months around That's five right. months yeah, it's exceptional months. given the average duration mm. at sea of most mm. uh, ships so it was a good thing that he stood there for so long if I was in in charge I'm not but if I was I would have probably sent the reinforcement before retiring mm -hmm. the the first boat uh, but so far it has done its mission mm. um, the 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 group the the think tanks that you mm -hmm. move around in is that generally what they're saying as well do you, do they find that this is uh you know uh, we didn't have a really official position on that point mm. uh, but i think we were very satisfied of uh, the mission that had been accomplished mm. and having the gabriella seal sealant out there mm -hmm. uh, what is the expectation now I think it's a sign. You don't send your flagship for no reason. You, you want to send a message. You know that China is very good at sending message. America is very good at responding to some of this message. But uh, I think it's good that the Philippines does a step forward. The, the, the spokesperson of the National Maritime Council, Alexander Lopez, said mm -hmm. that uh, the Philippines will stop disclosing uh, the, the, the movements of their vessels. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, we should have done that from the onset? I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, we can draw parallel about that, about the conflict in Ukraine. At first, the uh, authorities there were uh, communicating a lot of, we have received this and this from such and such ally, we, have, we are about to do this operation. Uh, it kind of, uh, for me, a good, a good aspect in the short run to, to mobilize the population so that the government is uh, determined. But on the long run, of course, you, you shouldn't give your adversary all the keys to what you're doing or planning uh, ahead. Should the Philippine government have asked for help resupplying the Magbanwa, mm -hmm. um, given that the U.S. has extended help, <coughs> as uh, the U.S. has already said that they were happy to escort the boats mm -hmm. to resupply the Magbanwa. I'm sure we could have counted on the French too, or Australia, or Japan, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, but I don't they think didn't. France has enough <coughs> boats to do this kind of operations, or not too often. Uh, in the case of the U.S., I think it was important for the Philippines to do it on its own. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would always give this image um, that goes in the sense of what China is saying. Oh, the Philippines is a puppet of the U.S. It's provocating China mm -hmm. on behalf mm -hmm. of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So doing it on, on their own mm -hmm. is a good thing. In it my could opinion. have done... It could have done it multilaterally, though, with other countries. Um, I would imagine that it's possible to do a, um, a resupply exercise, multilateral resupply exercise. That would make sense. But maybe one, two, three times a year, not on a systematic basis. Mm. Uh, and by the way, I think it's uh, quite recent that the U.S. proposed to do it because for a, a long time, they practiced strategic ambiguity with the Philippines about mm -hmm. the MDT. Mm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good thing that they are stepping up. The mm. Well, speaking of doing it alone, it is budget season. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been uh, deliberations on the revised uh, Armed Forces of the Philippines Modernization Program. Yes. Mm -hmm. And apparently their proposal for $245 billion budget has been reduced. Only $75 billion has been approved. Mm -hmm. While that is bigger than the 2024 number, uh, it is still below minimum. Um, it, it, it is at 1.83%. Uh, Compared to GDP, I mean, mm -hmm. what what message does that send? Like, we have uh, we have increased the budget, but still yes, the falls way below. Well, we, what we it have events be. of this kind in Europe too, so I wouldn't be the the one to lecture the Philippines. Um, but what we see still is, if we remember, about Horizon Phase One or Phase Two, uh, uh, there's been a long way. It, it's much more uh, efficient today than it was at the beginning. Uh, budgets can be lower than expected, but still we are at, at a plus, not at a minus, compared to what should have been dispersed by mm -hmm. the government. And we can still hope for discussions and hard negotiation at the Senate uh, about this. Well, the ND Secretary Gil Gilbert Chodoro said that. Uh, globally, uh, countries have their defense budget at 4% of GDP. Mm -hmm. 
and 2% being the minimum. Is that correct? Uh, it's, it's more complicated than this. In Europe, we are more around 2%, rather slightly below mm -hmm. 2%, mm -hmm. and we are uh, heading to 2%. 4% uh, is more uh, very active militaries, like the Russian ones or the Americans. Uh, mm. yes. But in Europe, the standard Those is Those who are at war. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Currently, there's 251 <coughs> Chinese vessels. Mm -hmm. Depending on the weather, too, it could decrease. Then they go back. Sometimes mm -hmm. they, there's more. Are we expecting more based on your research uh, and uh, the flow, the pattern, perhaps, since you've seen this also in other areas? Uh, based on data that I have access to, what we know is that 250 is a max. So it's 250 ships in the whole area. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the number of ships, of maximum number of ships per feature, so uh, for example, Sabina Shoal, Whitson Reef, and Iroquois Reef, there we have reached a max of 100, around 100 boats stacked together uh, at one place. So it's it's more a matter of uh, how they occupy than how much num uh, how much ships you have to occupy, uh, because if they are moving around, they are much more dangerous than if they are stacked. So uh, yeah, you need to take different. Uh, as, uh, aspect into account mm -hmm. and they are the more dangerous where it's a mix of Navy, Coast Guard and Maritime Militia mm -hmm. because there you know that they have a plan. If it's only mm -hmm. Maritime Militia they are here to occupy, sort of occupy the place. They don't do anything uh, right. but if it's a mix then it starts being dangerous mm -hmm. because Benjamin, you will have Maritime yeah. Militia first, <coughs> Coast Guard later and then mm -hmm. at, at the very last Navy, Navy just to show if it's escalating they are ready to go. Mm -hmm. oh. Benjamin, you specialize in asymmetric warfare, mm -hmm. and you've been trying to, um, you know, raise awareness of it to Filipino officials here. What's the response been like? Uh, actually, I was quite pleased because the last time you invited me, uh, it was just before I met with General Brunner, Commodore Tariela, mm -hmm. and uh, Admiral Dassi. Mm -hmm. quite, quite a, n a nice list of, uh, of people. Uh, they were quite pleased about my research, uh, especially about Vietnamese presence in the Spratlys. Well, I would say it's more peaceful than the Chinese one. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm really eager to, to cooperate. I'm, I'm trying to communicate with uh, as many experts, uh, Jay Batong Bakal, Justice uh, Carpio, and others. Do, do you feel like there's there's uh, enough awareness of it now, of asymmetric warfare? I would say much, much more, and, for sure. And, and what, what sort of message is China, China trying to send there? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's a bit of a complicated message because they, they are not saying exactly what they want. They, they never gave the coordinates of the dashes. They have, they have updated or downgraded the number of dashes. They have ne never explained what exactly they claimed inside it. There are seven different versions, uh, m maybe more. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a version. Ministry of Defense has another version. Such think tank or such university has another uh, version. But we still don't know which one is a good one. So that's very frustrating. Uh, so we, I, I keep wondering, do they do it in purpose or is it just random like that, that they have so many ways to see the same thing. Uh, but you, you would have oversight over the movements in the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea. Do you think we're maximizing our vessels? Uh, over the past years, the government has ordered a lot of ships. The problem, in my opinion, is that it ordered the ships from um, too many origins. We have nine countries providing oh. it, Israel, France, Australia, the US, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, and Philippines why, why proper. Why is that a problem? Is it it better to source mm. from different countries? It was a stopgap, what they call themselves, a stopgap strategy to, to, uh, to put as many ships uh, uh, where it's needed. The problem is that when you order so many ships, you have too many radars, too many engines, too many everything. So it creates uh, some kind of logistic nightmare mm. that then creates They're difficulties in the, in the short term, it's good. In the middle to long term, it's bad. So. Uh, I think there are about 100 types of engines for the whole Navy and Coast Guard. Mm. And they have ordered so much, then now the, the Coast Guard doesn't even have its own uh, maintenance capacity. Mm. And you are in town again, uh, lest we forget, for ADAS, yes. Asian Defense and Security? Yes. Is that, did, did I get that correctly? Yes. Okay, talk us through that, what to expect there. Well, it's a, it's a big event. Uh, it's the 10th year, so it's, it's an important uh, anniversary. Tomorrow we will have uh, a lot of VIPs coming, uh, and uh, I, I don't have the list, and if I had it, I couldn't share, but still, it, uh, we are expecting a, a, few, a few tens of thousands of people to, to attend. Everything's almost ready, uh, but by midnight it should be ready. But, but this is a symposium of uh, Asian defense ministers, is that correct? Uh, not exactly. So you have the show in itself, the defense exhibition show, and in parallel of the show you will have two symposiums. So there's uh, the first one that I co-organized, uh, that is about the South China Sea and uh, asymmetric warfare. And the second one, in cooperation with Stratbase, will be about uh, the future of defense. Mm. Mm. And uh, 
how, mu how many people are you expecting? Uh, as much as possible, but uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, in between 100 and 200,000 people would be nice. Ha has Manila always hosted this? Or it's, well, it's, it's uh, rotated around Asian cities? Uh, no, no. It, uh, ADAS is really in Manila. We okay. have uh, other events with other names in different uh, capitals. Is that open for all? Yes. Everyone, anyone can uh, register. And how do they register? Uh, online. online. Yeah, so we have if a dedicated website. If you type just ADAS 2024, you will have it so as a first result. Yeah, ADAS 2024. 2024. And Anyone then, who's interested yeah. in defense and security mm -hmm. in the That's region. Mm -hmm. And asymmetric warfare. Yes. In South China Sea. Pretty much <laughs> Filipino or Chinese. Well, or first of French. all, we are going to have <laughs> non-Western speakers. It was a very important point for me to have local speakers mm -hmm. from the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, but also from uh, South, uh, from East Asia, so Japan, Korea. Anyone from China? So it, uh, no. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, for this time, it, it was you, not my choice, but them? we will not have uh, uh, any Chinese representative you or uh, Chinese speakers. Them. Yeah, you should have invited them. Oh, it was a break. No, <laughs> would have been um, interesting. Would have been interesting yeah, to have that. Well, he right? said it's the first time. It's the first time that Asian. they're not attending. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know for the previous years, but uh, oh, okay. to, to give an example, on uh, on the French or European defense exhibition show, they were not forbidden Chinese citizens to uh, go on the show or to attend the conferences, but some areas were restricted. Oh. Here, the choice was made to uh, totally uh, close it. We're not expecting any big announcements from the symposium, are we? Oh, any I, cannot, I new couldn't defense, tell. Any new defense commitments to the Philippines? Well, not from the side of France, <laughs> but I know it's ongoing. The, the VFA talks, you mean, yeah. the Visiting Forces exactly. Agreement talks, fantastic. Sure. Uh, hopefully by the time we have you next, it'll be a done deal. My pleasure. We're going to have to leave that there. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Benjamin Blandin, Associate Researcher for Gordian Knot and Project Sea Light. Before we go, just one last news item very quickly. The Congressional Spouses Foundation and the MVP group of companies have officially sealed their partnership to provide medical assistance to soldiers. Earlier today, MVP Group Chair, Chairman Manny, Manny V. Pangilinan, Congressional Spouses Foundation Chair Yada Marie Romualdez and House Speaker Martin Romualdez personally attended the signing of the manifesto at the House of Representatives. The aim of this partnership is to establish specialized facilities for the military, including a new casualty and cancer center, cancer center being built at the AFP General Hospital. Phase 1 of the project will open in November, while Phase 2 is set for April 2025. Romualda said this will greatly aid in the treatment of active soldiers and their families. Through this initiative, we reaffirm our commitment to ensuring that our soldiers who bear the burden of defending our sovereignty receive the care and attention they need. It promises not only to address their immediate medical concerns, but also to provide long-term support PP group always been active in supporting uh, the armed forces of the Philippines. Actually, in the uh, uh, northernmost part of the Philippines, we had uh, we donated solar panels for the soldiers. Oh wow! There. And then we sent help all over uh, to, to like in the Mindanao area. Not something that's very well publicized, but very good to know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the show for us tonight. Uh, we are one news, all sides, all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night.